Welcome to the Wounded Angels Network where we're going through a series on grief. This looks at the five gates of grief as they were expounded by Francis Weller. Um, and I need to acknowledge Francis Weller for the headings of these five gates and for the concept, but um, everything else inside um, these talks is um, my own material collected over many years. So the second gate of grief that we are looking at today is the gate that encourages us to enter into grief and to mourn the places that have not known love. You'll remember the first gate. We remembered that we need to grieve that everything we love we will lose um, and the whole reality of impermanence. This gate, the second gate, um, encourages us to look at those places that have not known love because love is the most healing of energies and if there are parts in our life that have not known love those are the parts that are going to be suffering, are going to be dead, uh, are going to need to be mourned in the way that one would mourn a loss, um, any kind of loss. So just to recap, um, I've spoken before a few times about how we arrive in the world trailing clouds of glory. Um, as the poem says, we arrive um, with the whole oak tree inside the acorn, um, our, our self wanting to manifest and we are immediately um, checked. And the toddler's first word is the word no, because that's the word it hears most often. And society wants us to run on rails. And because of that, we, we're constantly breaking off parts of ourselves that we are experiencing as unacceptable in the world. The parts of us that are judged, the parts of us that are condemned, the parts of us that are rejected in relationships. And every time we break off those parts, we throw them into what I have described before as the shadow bag. And we run faster and faster towards this persona, this mask that has been, we have been told is our acceptable self and all the time throwing unacceptable parts into the shadow bag where we ignore them. Now, it's the same metaphor in this gate of grief. There comes a time when we need to grieve those parts that have not known love, those parts that have been deemed to be unacceptable or even at worst unlovable. And, and of course that begins with ourself. Um, there are parts of myself that I, that I don't like. Um, there are physical parts of myself that I, that I don't enjoy. I, I remember sitting in a dentist chair one day and he, the dentist was looking in my mouth and he said to me, Good Lord, uh, Mr. Woods, uh, the, the dear Lord didn't give you the best, prettiest set of teeth. And I said to him, well, what can I do, doctor? I'm from British settler stock and I got all the crappy settler genes. I got the crappy British teeth that are all skew and I, I got the John Bull body. What can I do? And we laughed because that was my legacy. But so there are parts of myself that I don't like, like my teeth <laughs> and the John Bull body. But, but at a deeper level, this becomes quite damaging when there are constantly parts of ourselves. And, and if you take um, some of the deep, deep suffering of our psyche, of our souls, um, it's often to do with unacceptability in the society around us. In extreme forms, it, it appears as things like anorexia, where, where this body just has to get smaller and smaller and smaller, or I have to remain a little girl so that I will have the love of my daddy and never lose that. Um, or it'll take the form in the opposite direction of piling on layers and layers of fat body armor because I want to hide my real self um, from the world. Um, I, I can't accept those parts of myself. And what Weller suggests in this gate too is that we, we take some time to mourn those parts of us that haven't been loved. Because love is a legitimate expectation if you are alive. To live is to be loved and to be loved well is to come alive. We, we, we glimpse those things, we, we have those moments. Now, 
One of the ways that we experience the opposite of being loved is not only that we don't accept parts of ourselves or we are told that there are parts of ourselves that are not acceptable physically, emotionally, um, personality-wise. There is also sometimes that unacceptability or unwantedness is put onto us through um, so people guilting us, uh, it's, a, it's a word that's gone from being a noun to being a verb, like, a bit like Googling. Um, but the experience of guilt and being guilted, being made to feel guilty, um, is often an experience that we have very, very young in our lives. We don't fit into the peer group, we don't fit into the gang, the girls in the in-group, all the pretty ones, all the cool kids tell us that we are not okay. So there's that guilting, that exclusion, I'm an outsider, I don't belong. But there's also, in a, another extreme form, those times when we've been bullied, uh, when, when we've actually violently been broken and thrown to the ground uh, by those who are more powerful or who we deem to be more powerful. Actually, as one gets older, you realize that the bully was actually the biggest jerk in the school and the most insecure person in the school. Um, but, but that takes time. Uh, when, when the bullying is happening, um, the bully has all this power and then breaks us with that power. And, and it's this whole experience of I can't be myself. I, I have to... I have to hold back on the blossoming of the oak tree that arrived in this acorn. And it's almost as if our lives are taken and if you, if you look at the Japanese art of bonsai, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very, very impressed when I see good bonsai work. It is absolutely beautiful at one level. But if you, if you consider behind bonsai what's actually going on, it is the constant thwarting of the tree from becoming its normal, natural, full self. Um, the bonsai artist constantly uproots the tree, trims around all the roots that would have taken deeper root and holds them back, similarly above the ground constantly trims at every little uh, shoot that's coming out, uses copper wire to wrap and bend these trees to, to become beautiful art forms. But how is that different at one level from taking little um, Chinese babies as they used to, um, thankfully it's no longer a practice, uh, where a little girl is born and her feet are wrapped tightly because small feet are considered acceptable and large feet not. And the most incredible deformity created by this wrapping of these teeth. So that's a good metaphor for us of, of often what happens in our own souls. We are bonsai We are bonsai by life. There are parts of us that are snipped off continually and not loved. And and how would it be to take some time just to grieve that? I grieve the day in high school when I uh, was called behind the tuck shop. Uh, word had got out that I might be becoming a prefect or maybe even the head prefect. And I was called behind the tuck shop where the cool gang kids, the big macho testosterone driven guys hung out and I was punched in the face and fell on the ground and told, and this could only have happened in the old apartheid South Africa, this would have had re relevance. I was told by the chief bully that I was getting too white. <laughs> That's wrong on so many levels, but, but you understand. Uh, that, that moment in my life was a bonsai moment. Um, it stayed with me, it's still with me, and Fortunately, I, I don't feel those same emotions when I talk about it now, but for years um, I couldn't speak about it without it creating some sense of that trauma and anxiety that I'd experienced on that day all those many years ago in 1973, a long time ago. So bullying, bullying can be incredibly um, damaging. Another, another way we experience not being loved can be um, by rejection. 
I often have conversations with clients who, who will tell me that in their family of origin that there was always some other sibling who either outperformed everyone and was the golden child and they were the child in the shadow or uh, what I've often experienced are clients who grow up and, and they are healthy and, and, and well formed but there is a very ill or, or um, severely disadvantaged, disfigured, perhaps epileptic or cerebral palsy sibling that then requires quite legitimately all the attention of the parents. Um, that makes absolute sense. But then there is the sense of deficit. There's, there's no, no longer any love left for this other child who comes and says, I just had to, I had to raise myself. That abandonment. Or, or the, the child that is told, you know, you weren't really wanted, you were a mistake. And, and often parents will say that flippantly, you know, we, we didn't plan to have more than two children and you're the third child, you were a mistake. Now, <laughs> there's no way of measuring the impact of how that lands with a child when they are told that they shouldn't really be there. And I, I often work um, with myself and with other people in, in that situation where, where I, I, I have this meditation of the moment when, when there are these egg cells hanging around um, inside the mother and there's these millions of little sperm swimmers um, swimming, swimming after the parents have made love and these sperm cells are swimming and swimming towards the egg and, and, and one of them out swims all the others and in that moment that that sperm cell penetrates the egg, life says this one, this one, yes! <laughs> Oh, what a wonderful moment, you know. I, I, life deemed me to be legitimate. Uh, another form of rejection, to tell, to tell children they were illegitimate. Fortunately, that language is disappearing. Uh, what does it mean to be illegitimate? Every person who's born surely is legitimate, for God's sake. But we have these things, you know, if you weren't married in a certain way or you weren't in a certain relationship and a child was born, the child is illegitimate. What about the person who's told that they are just the bad seed? You know, you are just the bad seed in this family. You are the shadow person. So all this guilt, all this shame, and we haven't even begun to speak about issues of xenophobia or of racism. What does it mean to be black um, in, in, a, in, in a culture where everything white is right? Um, and I, I have a, a theory about the future of Africa and I, and I have a sense that, that because the world constantly wants to project onto dark people with racism their own shadow, Africa has all, will always be under some kind of shadow curse. I don't mean curse literally, but I mean shadow heaviness in the sense that the world projects all its darkness onto what it calls the dark continent. Remember that name? Um, and so there's a sense in which a whole continent is going to struggle um, being unloved by the rest of the world that wants to get on with their sparkly white um, lives. And I, and I happen to be an African and people get confused when I say that, but I am an African. My roots are in Africa and I'm part of this continent and I, and I sense how it carries the shadow of the whole planet. How do we mourn that? How do we, how do we grieve our own individual bonsai nature that has been chopped and controlled and clipped and thwarted? How do we, how do we mourn? The fact that we've been bullied and told that we're not okay or we're the bad seed in the system or in fact we might be the wrong race for the planet. I mean, all of these things deeply, deeply damaging the places that haven't known love. Sometimes it's useful to realize that human integration, human healing is the product not of happiness 
but of suffering. And if one is to go on the journey of integration and healing, it is often through the portal of the grieving about our lost love and the inability of those around us to love us and the parts of us that have not known love. It is through accepting and acknowledging those parts and grieving for them and integrating them that we actually come to wholeness. I have learned very little, I've said this before, from succeeding. Everything worthwhile that I know I've come from failing. Um, one, after all, only discovers that grace is amazing if you have broken and failed badly and then experienced grace. That's how you know grace to be amazing. Martin Luther, the, the great Christian reformer, um, had this powerful experience of grace which led him to change his whole theological thinking and, and change the thinking of the church. And, and the great cry of the Reformation was um, sola fide, sola scriptura, um, um, sola gratia, um, which is Latin for by faith alone, by scripture alone, and by grace alone. So, so Luther had this deep sense of being deeply forgiven and healed by God, as, as he referred to it. Um, but then he had, a, he had a, a follower, a disciple, a, a guy called Philip Melanchthon. And, and Philip Melanchthon was one of those very scrupulous people. He did everything right and by the book all the time. Aren't they very painful? We know them all. But Melanchthon was one of these scrupulous people. And, and Luther used to get very frustrated with him because he never did anything wrong. And he would say to Melanchthon, for God's sake, Philip, go and sin and sin boldly. Otherwise, you won't ever understand grace. <laughs> so it's through that pain, it's through that suffering that we, we enter, through the grieving for the parts that haven't known love, that, that we begin to experience grace. And that's where I love uh, the words of the song by, by Leonard Cohen that he wrote towards the end of his life. He, he's most famous from that period for that song, Hallelujah, um, which is well known. But he, he's got another song which is absolutely magnificent, lesser known, called Anthem. Um, so, so look it up. Um, you'll find it on, on, on many platforms. Um, Anthem by Leonard Cohen. And the re refrain of the song goes like this. Ring the bell that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack. A crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. That's how the light gets in. So through the cracks and the brokenness of those parts of our lives that, that haven't known love and our grieving for those losses, we also acknowledge that it's through those very cracks, through that very brokenness, that grace and healing comes to us. And so I, I need to... I need to um, say that the, the Japanese culture that gave us bonsai with all its beauty and yet darkness in terms of what it does in thwarting the trees, the Japanese culture has also given us a beautiful, beautiful image around this thing of brokenness and, and the parts of us that haven't known love. I was telling a client um, some months ago about uh, this Leonard Cohen song and we were talking about the cracks and that's how the light get, it gets in and and my client said oh but don't you know about Kintsugi and I said no I don't know anything about it, Kintsugi and he said well Kintsugi is a, a Japanese art form where if you break a precious vase or a precious bowl porcelain bowl or vase you don't throw it away you take it to a Kintsugi artist and, and what the Kintsugi Asa does is he puts these pieces together where the cracks are and then pours gold, almost like gold filigree, into the cracks and so creates from your broken piece of porcelain pottery something even more beautiful um, with the gold that is now filigreed into um, the, or poured into the, into the cracks. And, and I, when I heard it, I thought, yes, this is a metaphor for what happens when we can grieve the parts of us that haven't known love, when we can look at the cracks, acknowledge that it's been caused by 
criticism and rejection and bullying and exclusion and shaming and blaming. We bring all of those pieces to ourselves and we look at them and then we allow the gold to be poured in because then with the integration and the grieving for all that love loss, we actually become more compassionate and more loving people. Now the ego doesn't often want to do this. The ego often resists that. Because if we were to acknowledge our brokenness, then what would happen of our perfect image and, and the ego's persona that it presents to the world and tries to defend itself with? Um, and often that'll come up in conversations like, oh, you know, I can't, I'm too bad to be forgiven. I'm too broken to be healed. Don't be nice to me. Well, you have to ask whether that's just ego resistance. Um, you really think there's parts of you that are not acceptable? You really think you're so bad that you can't be healed? Um, isn't that just a little vain in, in a weird reverse kind of way? Everyone, everyone can be healed. Everyone, everyone has cracks. Everyone, everyone can have gold poured into the cracks as the light comes in. And it's, it's in the morning through this gate too of the places that haven't known love that we come to healing and wholeness. And so I thank you for coming with me through gate two of Francis Weller's Gates of Grief and invite you to spend some time just looking at the places in your own life that haven't known love and how if you mourn them and grieve them and allow them to be Gold will soon arrive and you will find healing. Thank you for your attention.